Welcome to Political Inquisitions. We're here today to talk about all those taboo subjects such as religion, ethics, and morals. We're in front of uh, St. Peter's Chapel on Mare Island uh, on location and the beautiful thing about uh, St. Peter's Chapel is that it's the first interdenominational chapel in the service and it is the very first uh, naval chapel in the Pacific. So mm. it's quite an historical place. And we're joined uh, with uh, Paul Rialski, who is the co-chair of Dignity San Francisco, which is the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, QQI-2 nowadays, <laughs> of, so LBGT, QQI-2, is, is that correct, the gay Catholics? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay. Now, what are all those, for our viewers, what do all those letters stand for? Well, mostly we still are using the LGBT mm -hmm. um, for simplicity, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, Catholics, and we always mm -hmm. say our families and our friends. Some of the other letters, um, Q for queer, for mm -hmm. people to choose to identify by that label. Mm -hmm. um, I can mean um, inquiring. Mm -hmm. um, I is also references, pardon me, I also references intersex, which ah. is often taken under the umbrella of transgender. That would be people who were born um, with um, characteristics of both gender. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole movement in the U.S. Um, I forget the Intersex Association of North uh -huh. America or yes. something like that. And um, they are working to uh, have physicians only do surgery on mm -hmm. people born with those characteristics mm -hmm. when medically necessary mm -hmm. because a lot of people have suffered under years of practice where the physician would simply make their own determination on what they think it should be. Mm -hmm. And if the choice was not right, the person would suffer greatly later in life. Mm -hmm. So the idea now is to let those people grow up and then as they mature mm -hmm. and it becomes more apparent how they understand themselves to decide whether or not or when they might wish to do anything surgically to their body. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you uh, expanded on that a little bit because oftentimes when we talk about LBGT uh, issues, the T piece gets left off. Now, the two, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, two-spirited under the Native American tradition? What's, yes. What's that all about? Well, that's one way that the Native peoples have understood people who identify or in some way exhibit characteristics of both genders, mm -hmm. male and female. Mm -hmm. And so two-spirited people were very highly respected in the native communities mm -hmm. uh, as having special gifts, often leaders, spiritual leaders, that sort of thing. And um, so a number of people have identified with that and chosen to embrace mm -hmm. that. I think on the, t the topic of gender, um, one of the things that was very interesting to me as I have studied some of the transgender theology and, mm -hmm. and uh, psychology, mm -hmm. for my own understanding, is to realize that different cultures approach gender differently. Mm -hmm. There are cultures that have six genders. It's mm -hmm. not everyone has a split into two. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, nature doesn't follow that either. It's, as I recall, it's something like one in every 500 births has a chromosomal um, difference mm -hmm. from uh, the strictly XX or XY. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the cases where this was very interesting is in the case of athletes entering the mm -hmm. Olympics. Mm -hmm. There have been many cases um, when they are tested chromosomally or told they cannot participate because they're not the gender they thought they were or were raised to be because people can have all kinds of combinations other than the binary. And mm -hmm. um, Virginia Ramey uh, Molencott wrote a book called Omnigender in mm -hmm. which she calls for society to 
abandoned the binary gender construct for the simple reason that it causes so much suffering to so many human beings mm -hmm. who do not fit a very arbitrarily, subjectively, narrowly defined uh, de um, description of what it means to be male or female. Mm -hmm and also taking into consideration that a characteristic that might be thought of as ma masculine in one culture might be thought of as feminine in another. So it seems to me, um, as, you're, as you're talking about this, that, that there's a, a, a really a context, uh, and it's culturally based in terms of our, our, our biases, not only around homosexuality, but around uh, gender as well. Gender identity, yes. Uh, now, how does that, you, you, you mentioned theology, and, and you're here representing as a co-chair Dignity of San Francisco, right. which is the uh, gay and lesbian, transgender, and bisexual uh, uh, Catholic, Catholic community. group and community. Uh, and I imagine transgendered and two-spirited uh, um, folks are, are certainly included within the Dignity community, mm -hmm. too. Uh, what, broadly speaking, is is dignity? Well, dignity started initially in 1969, the same year as the Stonewall Uprising in New York, not directly connected with that, mm -hmm. um, when a group of Augustinian priests convened a conference. It was, this was coming out of the renewal in the church that occurred mm -hmm. with the Second Vatican Council and the spir initial spirit of dignity was to provide a place where at that time the term was gay Catholics mm -hmm. could come together and using the terminology of Vatican II um, f actively, fully and consciously participate in church life in all its dimensions. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was seen that that was not possible within the typical parish context. Mm -hmm. Surely, if you were speaking of your identity, you could simply follow the old method of pay, pray, and obey. Mm -hmm. But in terms of being able to look at the church as a place to fully develop as a person in terms of meaningful relationships, sacramental support, mm -hmm. um, witnessing to the truth of your life it, publicly in the community, that was not seen as being available. So dignity initially saw itself as forming to provide a context where that could be true until such time as that was fully possible within mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic Church as a whole, at which point dignity's need to exist would go away and dignity would dissolve, and that's how it would happen. I remember back in the old days when I was a member of dignity, mm -hmm. still within the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. tradition and prior to being received into the old Catholic faith tradition, uh, when I was participating in Dignity, there, there was a, um, a slogan, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Dignity is a bridge, uh, it, it, and I, I, I think particularly Dignity San Francisco, because of the bridge between right. Oakland and, 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 and San Francisco, but Dignity was kind of a bridge back into the Roman Catholic Church, or how, well, how was that? Well, I was around in the late 70s. I mean, mm -hmm. Dignity San Francisco formed in 1973 uh, when a pastor of a church in the mission, I believe his name was Monsignor O'Connor, as I recall, mm -hmm. um, said, well, surely with the large gay community, San Francisco should have a Dignity chapter here. Mm -hmm. So he called a meeting and sent word throughout the archdiocese, we're going to have this organizational meeting mm -hmm. at my parish. So mm -hmm. that's how it got started. I, uh -huh. I came into the scene in the late 70s. Um, I, we used to have a, a newsletter called Bridges, and there mm -hmm. was also another group in San Francisco um, called Bridge Building. Mm -hmm. Um, which was a, another separate entity. It was a house mm -hmm. over in the Richmond district where people could come who were mm -hmm. not sure of their comfort with the Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. that was definitely an, a way to bring people back in. Dignity has always supported people, both coming into Dignity to um, use that as a gate to mm -hmm. going and being involved in other Catholic parishes, mm -hmm 
But for many people over the years, it's also become a place for people put to put down roots, mm -hmm. who find this as an authentic Catholic community that serves their needs fully and where they can be completely open about who they are. The first 15 years we were in San Francisco, um, like most Dignity chapters at that time, we met in Catholic churches. First at St. Peter's in the Mission District, then at St. John of God out in the Inner Sunset, and finally at St. Boniface um, in the Tenderloin. And, and then you left St. Boniface in the late 80s, as I recall. Our last Mass there was on December 18th of 1988, the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we did an Exodus liturgy mm -hmm. and did a candlelight march to the steps of St. Mary's Cathedral. This was after we had been given a choice between taking a, a stand of neutrality mm -hmm. on the national statement of position and purpose, mm -hmm. which we had changed um, at our national convention in, in Miami and yes, Val Harbor in yes. 1987. I remember. And we said, we can't chain, take, be neutral on this. We wrote it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we were told we'd have to leave the Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. Then, um, but there are some dignity chapters that continue to meet in, uh, in Catholic churches. I believe correct? that's true, but very few. Mm -hmm. um, there mm -hmm. were some dignity chapters which entered into arrangements with the diocese, where the diocese would have a mass for gay and lesbian Catholics, and dignity could attend and hold meetings afterwards, mm -hmm. but not talk about dignity during right. the mass, and various other kinds Indeed. of arrangements. We, yeah. on the other hand, realize the need mm -hmm. to um, not take that stand, but to be clear, because of the letter that then Cardinal Ratzinger had written in mm -hmm. the pastoral letter in 1986, which said some very terrible things about um, homosexuals being intrinsically disordered, mm -hmm. behavior to which no one has any conceivable right and the like. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that letter seemed to have been directed more to dignity groups than to individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it even seemed very close to our own experience at Dignity San Francisco. Um, at the time and still to this day, it's my perception that the, the motive for that letter was really not to do with church teaching about gay people. It had more to do with the desire of the institutional church to maintain or further secure their power and position. Because at that time, you may recall, Catholic parishes were increasingly suffering from the lack of ordained Roman Catholic priests mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, which personally I think includes the non-ordination of women. But in any case... And married priests. And married priests, exactly. Mm -hmm. and many Catholics in leadership across the nation were saying, what can we do? We do not have a model for a priestless parish. Mm -hmm. And other people within that same circle were responding, sure we do, we have dignity. Mm -hmm. Because dignity was unique in that it's a lay-led organization that up till that point, when that letter came out in 86, had attracted Roman Catholic priests who wanted to offer support to the movement. Mm -hmm. And they would decide how, whether or not to accept the offers mm -hmm. of support and the priests would preside and offer the sacraments and whatever else, according to what the dignity members um, s chose to have from their perspective. And so one of the complaints was of that letter was you're using they're using your priests. Mm -hmm. They're not assigned by the local mm -hmm. ordinary, the bishop, and you're using the space and just renting to them. So you're not controlling who goes there, what they're preaching, or where the money's going. And so the thought was that if this model went to the larger church, mm -hmm. it might totally change the whole structure. That, and it might have been quite risky for those uh, priests who presided at liturgy as well. As I remember in the 80s, uh, Priests who were involved with dignity would often have their first name and then last initial, uh, but not full name, be surname, because of uh, being identified and then maybe ostracized by their own bishop. Huh? 
Well, that was particularly true after the 1986 letter. Uh -huh. See, that's the interesting divide because prior to that time, the, and this was one of the things that the Ratzinger letter mm -hmm. objected to, was the vast majority of clergy and bishops in the U.S. Mm -hmm. thought of dignity as our ministry mm -hmm. to, to the LGBT community. In other words, prior to that letter, um, dignity was looked on by the majority of Catholic priests and bishops in the U.S. Mm -hmm. as being the Catholic movement. And that letter even said you should be supporting courage, not dignity, and yeah. courage being the organization uh, that seeks to promote the idea that mm -hmm. people can be um, converted from mm -hmm. homosexuality to heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. And they used an Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program approach, as I, as I understand. Well, I honestly don't know, mm -hmm. and I have to say that mm -hmm. seems like a mis misuse of those steps and tools. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, would, I would think. Um, well, Paul, let me ask you this. Uh, seeing that dignity is not totally in sync with Roman Catholic official teachings, mm -hmm. How uh, do Dignity members reconcile themselves with the official Roman Catholic Church? So that's the question I often get. Well, Dignity members, as with any element in the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, are going to have a variety of perspectives. Uh -huh. uh, I would say at this point that m probably the majority of people involved in the movement across the country see themselves as celebrating something of who they are. They claim, we claim the Roman Catholic tradition as our own, acknowledging the church as the body of Christ, not simply the institutional model of church, but there are many different models of church as the late Cardinal Avery Dulles noted mm -hmm. in his book, Models of the Church, of which mm -hmm. the institutional is only one. So most of us see ourselves as celebrating and upholding the tradition of the church, recognizing that tradition with a capital T is a conversation that's been going on for 2,000 years of which we're a part. Hmm. Um, so the uh, teachings of the church aren't static, they're, they're something uh, continuing. Well, they continue in. to evolve. We have mm -hmm. many examples of that in our history as a church. Right. I always like to point to the story of John Courtney Murray, mm -hmm who was, is an American theologian known for his work on religious freedom mm -hmm. and particularly our tradition in this country of uh, having the separation of church and state, which was very um, feared by the Vatican, which mm -hmm. was still in the model of Catholic countries. Mm -hmm. And he was silenced for his writings in the 1950s, I think around 1953, but in the early 60s, say mm -hmm. around 1963, he was brought to the Second Vatican Council mm -hmm. to actually write the article on religious freedom mm -hmm. for that document, which is the highest level of document you can have is mm -hmm. from a church council. So we saw in that case a change from someone being silenced in one decade to being held up as mm -hmm. an author of the church in the next. So to presume that the point of view that's being presented on LGBT and the rest of the letters, Catholics mm -hmm. at this point in time will always be the teaching of the church. Mm -hmm. We, most of us, I would believe that this will change too. Whether it happens in our lifetime is not something we can predict. So we're going on, as many others have done before, doing the work of the church, living our lives, proclaiming our experience and putting it in the context of the scripture, mm -hmm. theology, church tradition and the church may catch up with us down the road. <laughs> and, and in many ways being a prophetic witness within the ongoing dynamics of, of, the, of a growing church. I, I recall when I was in Dignity, I was, mm -hmm. uh, you might recall, uh, because we were in Dignity at the same time yes. in the 80s, I was co-chair of, of the education committee. Right. And we were invited at that time to go down to St. Patrick's Seminary as Dignity. Exactly. Uh, to educate the seminarians on homosexuality and the church and the theology that we were bringing and our reflections from our own personal life-giving experiences. And then also at some Catholic universities we went into uh, to be a prophetic witness. It, it is, are those types of activities continuing Dignity today or are, you, or, or are those doors shut? Well, 
your, it, your point is really well taken. It underscores what I said about the change in the way dignity was viewed by the institutional church in this country in the early 80s versus the late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so no, we are no longer invited to perform those services. There are places in where elements of this continue in a sense. Um, you do have, uh, you know, gay-friendly parishes in San Francisco mm -hmm. where, um, for the most part, people attend and are open about who they are. Mm -hmm. What's proclaimed publicly is different, necessarily, in terms of the, the, the um, archdiocese's official positions. And the dissent within the... Right. Uh, within the congregation, I would imagine. And, yes. and some clergy in some of those parishes as well. Certainly. But they don't name it. It, it in yes. Publicly. Right. In, in the media, for example. Mm -hmm. But the support for dignity um, took an interesting turn. When we left St. Boniface and moved first to Dolores Street Baptist Church in the Mission until it burned down, and then we moved to 7th Avenue Presbyterian Church in the mm -hmm. Inner Sunset, two blocks from our earlier home of St. John of God. Um, the line that was carved in the stone, once they had us out of the building, mm -hmm. then the archdiocese was able to say about any statements we issued, we have no knowledge of this. Mm -hmm. So that provided a way for them to separate themselves from what we were doing, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to enter into a media mm -hmm. discussion in that way. So today, how, how does Dignity uh, San Francisco and maybe Dignity USA uh, differ from a local parish that might be gay friendly? And, and I'm thinking along the lines of, especially in light of uh, Proposition 8 and whatnot, are, Dignity provides some services that uh, 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 for LBGT community members that maybe a local parish that's welcoming and gay friendly and Catholic would not. What type of services does Dignity provide? Well, I think the first point is providing a context where people could speak completely, honestly, mm -hmm. and openly and hear preaching that is directed to them specifically in terms of um, the, who they are. So and that they're can, all blessed. Can gay you know. couples uh, have a, a, a wedding or a marriage within a, a dignity community? Well, each chapter handles that differently. In San Francisco, we have placed more of an emphasis on supporting the couples in their relationships. Mm -hmm. Typically twice a year, usually on the LGBT Freedom Day Pride celebrations mm -hmm. in June and on the Feast of the Holy Family in December, we will have all couples come forward for a, a blessing mm -hmm. of relationships in front of the whole community and acted on by the whole community to indicate that we believe these relationships are sacramental in their nature mm -hmm. and blessed by God and the community. There have been individual couples that have been married in relationships. Frequently, you know, weddings are private affairs and our focus is more on the public celebration mm -hmm. coming together for Eucharist of all members of the community. And so we continue to try to reach out to anyone that's marginalized, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't fit in. And so we also have had many straight people who found us and, and found an authentic experience of Christian community and chose mm -hmm. to put their roots down there. In fact, over the years, we've even had a couple go through the right of Christian initiation mm -hmm. of adults and be baptized and confirmed mm -hmm. going through the process and dignity. Wow. And so it's, it's a, we try, strive to be a welcoming and affirming community for all. Now, in, in states where uh, gay marriages and lesbian marriages are legal, do dignity chapters uh, celebrate the sacrament of marriage nowadays? Many, many chapters do. And many chapters also do so in states where it's not illegal um, uh, for gay couples to marry. What I would say about that is one of the things that struck me with Proposition 8 mm -hmm. was that during that window of time between the first Supreme Court decision and Proposition 8 passing, what happened was 
as everyone knows publicly, there are many denominations and many churches that will marry people of the same gender. That's a given fact. People know that, just as there are churches that will not. So what happened was that in that brief period, all of a sudden, those church, each church could do what they would do with any marriage legally, which is sign the marriage certificate and make it a legal marriage within the state for anyone they would choose to marry. Those churches that don't pe marry people of the same gender, well, they would obviously not be doing that, but they would do so for the weddings that they did perform. Mm -hmm. What happened with the pro passage of Proposition 8 is that the um, opinion of those churches that don't was imposed on those who do marry people of the same gender and the right to legalize the marriage of anyone that they would marry under their tradition was taken away from them. And I think that's a part that wasn't emphasized enough during the campaign. Now, obviously, the Judge Walker's recent ruling, which really emphasizes the civil rights, may take care of that mm -hmm. and restore things to a place where each church has the freedom to define what they consider marriage to mean in their tradition and who they will marry. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it sounds uh, promising and hope for the future. Uh, let's hope that the, uh, the legal aspects of this kind of unfold in, in, a, in, in a favorable way that's supportive and welcoming of all, uh, all people. Uh, Paul, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of topics today, a broad range of topics within the context of the Roman Catholic Church and dissent and informed conscience uh, in a very short period mm -hmm. of time. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you being able to kind of capture, li ca capture the essentials of, of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and how one can dissent and still remain a Roman Catholic mm -hmm. uh, in a very... Uh, precise way um, and I appreciate you taking the time really being with us today uh, I know that you're a busy person and <laughs> our friendship goes back many years and Indeed. so it, it, it's uh, quite a quite a nice thing to just see you on a personal level mm -hmm. so you take care and and thank you for being here with us thanks for having me okay